To me, this gets at one of the most important mental models themes in life where you just say, okay, so how do I build my life around deferred gratification? This has to be a master principle. In, in a world where most people are being really short-term and are focusing on, on, on short-term pleasures, it becomes an enormous competitive advantage if you can shift towards deferred gratification. And this runs through every area of life. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of Top Traders Unplugged, where today I'm joined by William Green, the author of one of the best books I have ever read called Richer, Wiser, Happier, which really is a fitting title for what the book is all about. So first off, William, thanks so much for joining me today. I really look forward to our conversation. How are you doing? How are things where you are? I, I'm great. I'm happy to be here with you. As I said to you before, I'm a little sleepy because I have a, a, a 20-year-old guitar playing, mandolin playing, singing daughter who's home from college. And managed to wake me up in the night, so so uh, it's a, it's a contest between the the coffee and 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 my sleepiness. So, but I'm I'm delighted to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Fantastic, excellent. Now, I said that your book is one of the best that I've ever read, but as I shared with you earlier, I actually did not read it. Instead, I got the audio book, and I listened to it this summer driving from Switzerland to Denmark, which takes about. 12 hours, about the same length as the audio book. So I highly appreciate that you made this journey so much more enjoyable for me and our golden retriever. Uh, thank you. It's I, I like the audio book. The audio book uh, is recorded by a guy called Raphael Corkhill, who um, I, I met for lunch in New York City a few months ago and became friends with. And it was kind of lovely. He's, he's an old Etonian, so he and I went to the same school, but he's much younger and better looking than I am. And so he's a he acts in in movies, and he's multilingual, and so and and he has this very kind of chiselled, uh, unusual face, and so he often plays Russian gangsters uh, because he I, I think he speaks Russian and he looks like a bit of a gangster, but then he has this extremely posh English accent. So uh, it's it, one of the pleasures unexpectedly of this book is that I've actually become friends with the narrator. Yes, no, absolutely, that's wonderful, actually. I would like to start out by saying that one of the reasons I'm so excited about having you on the podcast is that from listening to your book and from hearing you speak on other platforms, I feel that you represent and embody a lot of the values that we strive for on this podcast. You, you come across very generous and authentic, and you're also quite humble and vulnerable when you talk about your personal journey. I'm curious to know if you agree with my impression and how you became who you are today with these qualities, if I can call them that. Yeah, that's kind of you to say. I don't know if I'm particularly humble. I think probably like like many writers, there's a strange combination of characteristics where there's some there's some aspect of arrogance to a writer because you're saying people should be interested in what I say. And there's also this tremendous uh, insecurity and vulnerability, I think, often to writers, because I think you have to be worried about being wrong and always to be questioning yourself and always to be thinking, yeah, but what if I've, uh, what if I've missed the truth about this person I'm writing about? What if uh, maybe I need to do an extra call? Maybe I need to fact check more. Maybe. So there's this strange combination of uh, arrogance and vulnerability. And I think often in professions, actually, when you look at high performers in different professions, not to say I'm a particularly high performer, but, but you know what I mean? But high, high performers in various professions, I think, tend to have these slightly contradictory traits. 
that don't naturally go together, but come together in some magical chemical way that creates something unexpected. And, and so, so, so yeah, may, maybe there's humility, but there's also arrogance and, and pride and ego and all of those flaws. And so for me, it's a constant, it's a constant battle, a struggle to try to, to try to improve. I, so if I, if I've managed to fool you from my various interviews and, and the like into thinking that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm humble. That's a that, that's a good sign. Maybe, maybe you're picking up on something that I that I aspire to be one day. You never know. Now, one other thing I was sort of thinking about in 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 sort of um, listening to your book and and preparing for our conversation today is also as a writer. I mean, I'm not a writer, but as a writer, I and 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 in this sort of space of of investing, there's no shortage of books being written on on investing, and I was. I was just curious, how did you find sort of your voice when you wanted to get into this particular topic, but you also wanted to make it different and you to make it your own, make it unique? What kind of process did that sort of take in terms of getting to how you write today? It was a very long process for me, this book. I, I wrote it over about four or five years, and it was based on interviews that I've done over the last 25 years. And so I'd ruminated on all of these interviews for many years. And then when I started to write this book, I, I kind of went crazy and interviewed more than 40 people for the book. And in some cases would spend two days, five days with the person I was writing about. So it was pretty, it was pretty intense. And so I was all in. I, I had written stuff before. I'd written for magazines a lot, and I'd, I'd edited magazines, and I'd, I'd ghostwritten books, and I'd collaborated on books. But this one was in some ways, I was going to say my big break, but that sounds, that sounds sort of facile, it, it, it was sort of kind of silly. But it felt, this one felt like the stakes were the highest they had ever been. This was the first time where I was really flying solo, doing my own thing. And so I had total possession over the, over the project. And I wanted it to be really true to who I am. And I'm pretty idiosyncratic. And so I have these strange interests in things like philosophy and spirituality and literature and the like. And I see them as being very connected to investing. And so one of the stresses internally and probably externally was, is anyone going to be interested in these things that actually interest me? It seems pretty strange to write about morality and uh, ethics and how to deal with uncertainty and the fact that everything is changing and yet we have to... Um, we have to make decisions about an unknowable future. And, and, and for me to look at that from a through a Buddhist lens and say, well, this is really interesting because the Buddhists have been talking for thousands of years about the fact that everything changes and that's related to the market. So, so that was, that was kind of scary because I was bringing in all of this other stuff that I'm deeply interested in that on the whole, Wall Street wouldn't be interested in. So there's a there's a point, for example, where I'm I'm writing about um, Nick Sleep and Case Sicaria, and who are these two legendary investors? But when I say legendary, they were also almost unknown because they were so off the radar, and they were obsessed with Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. And so that for me is a perfect example of something where I can go deep on these fairly philosophical questions and say, look, it's, it's, it's related to, um, to investing. But as I said, kind of jokingly in the book, most Wall Street investors are not interested in mystical mumbo jumbo about motorcycles, which is what that book is about. And so I was writing about these things that were very true to me. Um, but until the book comes out, you have no idea if they'll resonate. And so it's it's kind of a terrifying experience writing a book if it's if it's really true to your own craziness. Mm -hmm. And what's been kind of wonderful about the the reception of this book uh, has actually been that the the things that I was taking the biggest risk on 
I think have turned out to be the things that resonated most deeply. And so there was a, there's a tremendous pressure to conform, whether you're writing, investing, doing anything. And, and the terror of not conforming and being true to yourself is so extreme. And yet that I think is where the, where the, where the real prize lies. And so for, for me that when, when I look back on the whole experience, the, the, the great, the great satisfaction in retrospect is that I took this gamble of trying to be true to myself. And I, I think there's, um, I, I'm not saying that in a self-congratulatory way. I, I, I'm actually saying it in a way that I think if your, if your listeners think intensely about this question of how to be true to yourself, it sounds like such a platitude, but it's, but it's so incredibly important. And what's, what's tricky about it is that we don't even really know what our self is. So, so you're trying to be true to something that's pretty elusive. And, and so it, it kind of, it comes into focus during the process of writing a book or setting up a fund or um, building a business. And then you look back and you're like, oh, that's, that's what I did. And that's, that's what I'm like. And, and so when I look at someone like, like Nick Sleep, for example, who I've become friends with as well since, since, since writing the book, I can see that he's just obsessed with this idea of quality that comes from Persig. And when I, when I look back, I'm like, oh, that's why Nick's story resonated so deeply with me, because I'm obsessed with quality as well. And, and when I see his kind of ornery ability to go his own way, and defy expectations and Zach as well, just tremendous outsiders doing things their way. I'm like, oh, that's what I've been obsessed with doing all these years is doing things my own way. And I, I can see when I look back on my career, just how frustrating it was to be in all of these institutions where I, I was trying to be loved and approved and be great and be admired and fill this deep hole you know, this sort of psychic hole. So people would be like, yes, you're fantastic. And it never quite worked. And then when you break free and you're like, ah, fuck it, I'm just going to try to be true to myself. That's so powerful mm. and it's so scary, but I'm, but I'm pretty sure that's, 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 that's the, that's the best course for me at least. So, so, so both for investing and for writing, there's this inner journey that I think is absolutely key. And, and may, maybe that's why the book has resonated with a lot of people is that they sense that it's an inner journey. It's an inner journey for me. Uh, and it's an inner journey for the investors I'm writing about. They're not just making money. They're, 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 that is the game. That's the, that's the outer part of the game. But it's also a pursuit of truth. You're searching for truth as an investor and you're searching for truth as a writer. And, and that's incredibly elusive and enigmatic. But both of these things, writing and investing, are a, are a quest for truth in a very murky and uncertain and changing world where we don't really know much. Yeah, no, completely agree. And I think that a lot of people actually, when they, when, a lot of successful people have gone through that same process and realized that just by being themselves, even though it's incredibly hard uh, and of course you you have to be very vulnerable when you when you are but that is actually how they get their breakthrough so um so yeah i mean this is this is uh, great william because i think that that's exactly how i um the, what i took away from the book as well can can i just mention neil, neil yeah because you said something really important there's a beautiful phrase from josh waitskin who i admire a lot who, who wrote this great book the art of learning and who's a uh, been an athlete and a chess champion and a coach to hedge fund managers. And he talks, I, I think I, I stole this phrase once from an interview that he, he did with, with Tim Ferriss. He talks about unobstructed self-expression. And that's a really beautiful and important concept. You, what you're looking for at the, at the highest levels of, of any profession, I think, is unobstructed self-expression. And so your, your craziness and your eccentricity and your weird skills have to somehow be part of your success. You can't, um, you can't play somebody else's game 
and really reach the highest level, I think, because you feel misaligned in some way. So, so there's an element of, there, there is this element of the inner journey where you're looking to get to a point where you're like, ah, oh, that's who I am. And, and to structure your business or your, your fund or your, or your writing career or whatever it is, in a way that's that's truly aligned with who you are in a in an unobstructed way is a very profoundly important thing and it's difficult because it changes as well who who you are changes your circumstances change and so it's not a it's not a static thing where it's like great i figured it out <laughs> it's constantly changing and so you're always slightly uneasy but i do think I do think that's the goal. And when I look at a lot of the great investors that I've written about, they strike me as being pretty aligned with who they are. There is a degree of unobstructed self-expression, uh, whether it's a, a Monish Pabrai or a, a, a Joe Greenblatt or an Ed Thorpe. These are people who are, I think, true to themselves. And I, I think when you're feeling misaligned in your own life, you kind of know it. And you're like, yeah, this just doesn't quite feel right. And that's, that's actually, that's a pretty helpful feeling because it pushes you. It's so uncomfortable that it pushes you to say, no, nah, this isn't working. What, what am I going to do to change things up? So I actually am more aligned with, with who I am. Yeah, no, cool. I'm going to stay a little bit with the process before we dive into the book, although we are going to talk about your latest book, Richer Wise, a happier, of course. And as I said before, I encourage everyone to get a copy of it and maybe an extra one for someone you care about. Um, but I want to start a slightly different place. I mean, I can only imagine that with so many years of interacting with the world's lead investors, spending countless hours uh, and days uh, even over many decades in their company, you could have written a much longer book. And to get a glimpse into how your mind works, perhaps you could start out by talking a little bit about maybe some of the people, maybe some of the stories that you did not put into the book and how you decide whether to include something or whether to leave it out. Yeah, there was a lot of pain involved in leaving certain things out because if if you get deeply inside someone's head and deeply inside someone's life, who you're you've been interviewing either over years or over days or over many hours, you feel slightly guilty. There's almost like this sense of betrayal at not writing about them at length. And to some degree, it was just impossible because I take so long over everything because I'm so obsessive about both the reporting and the writing that I simply couldn't go deep on everything. And And so that was kind of painful. So at a certain point, I just, for for example, someone like Bill Miller, who I've spent probably 90 hours or so interviewing over the last 20 something years, and who was the most successful mutual fund manager of his generation, has an extraordinary history, and an incredible mind. I, I write about him in multiple places, and he's in the epilogue of the book, which is kind of a, a very important position to be in. So he So he plays an important role. But I, I wish I had written an entire chapter about him. And at a certain point, I just thought, I have so much that if I really go write a big chapter about Bill, it's going to take me five months. And my editor is going to kill me because I'm already two years late on this book. And I just can't do it. And I'm going to save some stuff for the next book. And that was how I justified it emotionally to myself because it is kind of torture to have amazing material and not be able to use it <clears throat> excuse me on the other hand what i re what i really was doing was when i was writing this book saying i'm i'm not i'm not going to save anything for another book i'm going to do this as if this is the last thing that i ever do and i'm going to put heart and soul into it and so then what i kept doing So, so in a way, it's like a, 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 a psychological trick that you're playing on yourself to say, well, I will do another book and I'll be able to do more on this subject, this subject and this subject. So, so people also like Jeff Gundlach, who's the king of bonds, who I spent probably three hours or so doing this amazing interview. I give him like one sentence or two sentences in the book. And so I had to also say, okay, I'll come back to that. He's a very, very interesting guy. 
curious guy. But partly what I kept doing, because, it, because there was so much time I spent on my own working on this book, so you're really thinking deeply. It's kind of like this strange monastic life where you're just constantly thinking about, about what you're writing and the people you're writing about. So partly what I kept doing is saying, what's the eye of the eye of the bullseye here? So if I had, say, 30 hours of interviews with someone, it's hundreds of pages of notes. Who are, I mean, and then books by them or about them or all of their shareholder letters or just enormous amounts of material. And you would look at this stuff and it's pretty overwhelming and my mind's pretty scattered. And so, so you take it. So I would write these enormous outlines where I'm trying to figure out this goes to here, this goes here. But then you're thinking, okay, what's the, what's the eye of the eye of the bullseye? If I, if I, if I'm writing about, say, Charlie Munger, what's the single most important thing that people need to know about Munger? Or what's, what's the single most important thing that people need to know about um, Sir John Templeton? And so that, that for me was a very useful organizing principle or strategy, that sense of just going for the true essence of something, because otherwise it just becomes overwhelming. And, and, so, so I did that with pretty much every chapter. Every chapter has probably an anchor character in it who's the main character, but then there are often other characters who I'm working in. And sometimes, I, I, I mean, I write about someone like Michael Price, who's one of the great value investors of all time. Again, a paragraph. Hmm. And so you're, or, or Peter Lynch, who I interviewed 20 years ago, or Jeff Vinnick, who I interviewed, who was the, the, I think when he was about 33, he was managing the Fidelity Magellan Fund, which is the biggest mutual fund in the world. I had I had an amazing interview with him many years ago. And I'm, and I'm just taking a, a few paragraphs. And, and all I'm doing is saying, look, it, 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 it connects to what I'm writing about Will Danoff, who's, who's now probably the, the, you know, one of the giants of Fidelity. And so when I was looking back, I'd be like, God, this is crazy. I have like... I have interviews over the last 20 years with Peter Lynch, who was the giant from Fidelity, talking about what he learned from his boss, who was the founder of Fidelity, Ned Johnson. Then I have the next generation, the, the Jeff Vinnick, who ran the Magellan Fund, who was like a giant of that generation. And then I have Will Danoff and Joel Tillinghast, who were the, the giants of the, the, the who of the last 20 or 30 years there. So I would have what is that, four generations of fidelity giants. And you'd have to think, what, what can I actually include? So that, that sifting process is, is torture. But I, I, I wonder if it's the same with an investor where you, you, you have to say, well, yeah, there are 3,700 stocks or whatever in the US and, and, and I only need to own 10 of them or five of them or 25 of them or something. So there's always this sifting process, always this process of getting getting to the essence and kind of purifying. And I, I had a discussion with a friend of mine a few weeks ago, a very good hedge fund manager called Josh Tarasov. And um, we were talking about Alibaba and, and, and he's half Chinese. And I was saying, you know, do you, do you, do you own any Chinese stocks? And, and he was like, no, no. And he, he said at a certain point, he, he said he had owned Alibaba a few years ago. And he said at a certain point, he was, he was in this group of people that were discussing Chinese stocks, and he realized this is really difficult, and I only need to own ten or maybe twelve stocks. I don't, I don't need this. It's I, I, and and so I, I thought that was a really interesting piece of self discipline to be able to stick with the thing that for him was the eye of the eye of the bullseye. So I, I think I think the sifting process of concentrating on the really important things. The, the the essential things in in any area of your life is is it's it's really it's really critical yeah no i co i completely agree now the book of course it is a a tribute to some of the greatest investors of all time and many of them we know and and many of them we associate with having the best track records out there and we will certainly dig into some of those characters but what really caught my attention um, was really your own selection of a role model uh, who's not famous and he doesn't have a billion dollars to his name, but rather someone who was born um, in Amsterdam, I think, 
just before World War II were were uh, starting. So, um, so what is to use your own phrase? What is the essence of Arnold van der Berg? Why did you choose him as your your role model? Yeah, when when I started work on the book, I had, I had I had interviewed Arnold for a previous book that I'd written, the the Great Minds of Investing, where I didn't have full control and. I'd become kind of mesmerized by him and we talked a lot. And when I wrote my book proposal, uh, which I sent to Scribner, which is a, a famous old imprint of Simon and Schuster, and it's where people like Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote, I, I knew that Arnold was going to be a key character. And he and Monish Pavrai were the very first people I went to interview when I was working on the book. Um, so I arranged to go spend two and a half days, I think, with Arnold Vandenberg in Texas. And my editor, when he responded to my book proposal, one of the comments that he made was, was, I don't understand why Arnold Vandenberg is in the book. And so one of my challenges was, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make clear why Arnold is such a key character. And I'm going to end the book with Arnold because he, he's so important. He embodies something that's so important. And so that challenge from my editor in a way was very helpful because it forced me to think through why I admire Arnold, what, what's important about him. And, and I, think, I think the reason Arnold is so, is so important is, is because he embodies what actually constitutes a successful and, a, and an abundant and rich life. And so if I'm writing a book about wealth and wisdom and happiness and i'm writing about a bunch of people who made hundreds of millions or billions of dollars but they're not very admirable in some cases then that's going to leave the reader a little cold they may not know it because they may have gone to read the book just because they want to get rich but i'm trying to say no 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 richness goes much deeper than um than just making money and here's a guy who embodies real wealth Part of what's extraordinary about Arnold is that he started in such an unlikely circumstance where everything was stacked against him building this extraordinary successful life. So he was born in 1939 in, on, on basically the same street as Anne Frank in Amsterdam as a Jewish kid placed in hiding for the first couple of years of his life by his parents who were terrified that the Nazis would come in and search and find him and his brother Sigmund and they'd all get taken to Auschwitz and killed and the, the kids would typically be the first to get killed and so he started under the worst possible circumstances so that already is interesting because you're like here, here we are we've all comparatively had pretty easy lives and yet we complain a lot about how miserable we are and how difficult everything is. And Arnold takes this terrible hand that he's dealt early on and somehow turns it into a winning hand. And, and, when, and so I wanted, I wanted to tell the story of just how dramatic that transformation was. And so I went deep into, into his early years, so talking about how his his parents basically took this gamble where they said we need we need to put him in hiding but it, it, not just in the house because if the house is searched we're all toast and so they contact the the dutch underground and a girl is a total stranger a 17 year old girl um who i name in the book took him at risk of her own life and her parents lives across the country to an orphanage uh, in in the countryside where he was hidden for the next four years so he basically spends four years in this orphanage where he's virtually starving and so they thought that he probably had malnutrition because he ate so poorly in these critical years of his life and may have damaged his brain and by the time his parents, who, who were sent to Auschwitz, but who miraculously managed to survive, by the time they came to pick him up when he was six, he didn't recognize them. And he couldn't really walk. He was mostly just shuffling around on his knees. And he said his father was terrified to pick him up because he was just skin and bones. His father thought he would break. And 
and his father wasn't even sure it was him. I mean, they, uh, it was, it was, I mean, it was about as bad as it could get. I, he told me a story recently where, if I remember rightly, he sung, his, his father sung a song or he sung a song to his father and they realized, oh, that was the song we used to sing. And that was how they were like, oh, okay, that's, we, we got the right person. It's the right family. And so, so you have this terrible childhood. He, he assumed that he, his mother actually didn't want him. And that was why he was sent away. He didn't realize that his parents were saving his life. So sense of abandonment, malnutrition. He was separated from his brother, Sigmund, who was raised by a, a couple who hid him on their farm. So he was away from his brother. Um, the orphanage, even though they saved his life, it was a tough place. I mean, I, I remember him telling me at one point, I don't think this is in the book, that he took some water, I think from the well, because he was really thirsty and they hadn't given him enough. Um, one of the nuns, I think it was, hit him incredibly hard in the face. And, it, you know, he must have been five or six or something. And I think many years ago, many years later, she came to visit the family in Los Angeles. And, you know, she had taken care of him and, and, um, and he refused to see her. Uh, she came to visit them, yeah, I, I, I guess years after the Holocaust. And so it was tough. It was intense. You know, you think you, you like you like these clean stories where everyone behaves well and, you know, the, the, the orphanage that takes care of you, they're all kind of wonderful and saintly. And it's like, no, they're humans too. And they were struggling and they didn't have enough food. And, and so then he goes to Los Angeles to this very difficult neighborhood, like East Los Angeles is a poor kid. His mom dresses him in, in lederhosen on his first day at this um, rough school. And he just gets beaten up on his very first day. And so he becomes this really tough kid, this streetwise kid who was a real fighter, um, but initially was so weak and so malnourished, uh, you know, and he said, he said, when you're like that, you're just, you're just prey, people just prey on you. So, so I was really fascinated by the, um, by the odds against him of a successful life. He, he heard very early on his mother talking to a psychologist because his parents were worried about him. And he overheard the psychologist say, well, yeah, maybe his brain's damaged. Maybe that's why he's doing so badly at school, because he just couldn't eat during these really formative years. And so he grew up thinking he was stupid and then barely gets out of high school. I mean, he showed me his high school transcripts and he's like, look, I, you know, I had two classes of shop and I he's like, I had a cappella," and he's like, I've got such a bad voice that I um." the teacher told me just to mouth the words rather than sing them because I would wreck the whole chorus. So he has true humility, right? I mean, he's telling you everything, everything that you shouldn't say when you're trying to impress an interviewer who's writing about you. So you get this picture of this guy who didn't really stand a chance. And, and then he marries his high school sweetheart and she runs off with another man. So he's totally brokenhearted. He's depressed. He's full of rage against the Nazis. He's full of rage against his parents because, again, these stories are not simple. And so his father, who is a very honorable, very noble, very truthful man who survived Auschwitz and had a great sense of, of um, ethics, was also violent and used to hit him. Mm. And at a certain point, Arnold hit him back. And his father was just sort of sitting in the living room, I think, with his head in his hands, kind of choked up. And he was like, I, I can't believe you would hit your own father. And Arnold was like, yeah, not only did I hit you, next time I'm going to hit you first. Um, and that was when his father stopped, stopped hitting him. And so, and likewise, terrible relationship with his mother, who was an extraordinary character, incredible personality, but difficult and would, would literally spray him and his friends with her hose because she disapproved of his tough friends who used to, used to back him up in fights that they got into. But he's still friends with those guys in his 80s. So I was really fascinated by this story because if you if you think about if you think about many of the great investors, they were handed their success to some degree. They went 
they went to Wharton or Columbia Business School or Harvard Business School or whatever. They were bright. Maybe they had loving parents. Maybe maybe they had, you know, a brother who was smarter than them or something. And they had a, a, a you know, a chip on their shoulder or whatever, or, you know, something that drove them. Who knows? But but they weren't as broken fundamentally. And here's Arnold, who had nothing going for him and was a psychological mess, full of rage, full of resentment. Um, full of depression, and yet turned it around. And that, to me, is an astonishing success because what you're doing is you're taking the worst possible hand and playing it brilliantly. And and so I wanted to tell that story because it's a way of saying to people that everything everything really is about um, consciousness. It's about how you take control of your own mind, of your how, of your own inner landscape. And, and what Arnold did is he took control of his mind. And so he would very consciously do things like when he was full of rage and anger, he would say, well, no, I'm a loving person. And he would say to himself over and over again, no, I'm a loving person. And so this gets at a really important theme that I, 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 wanted, to, I wanted to make a central theme of the book, even though maybe it would seem crazy in an investing book, which is to say, you can be as rich as you want and as successful as you want, but if you don't master your inner landscape, then it's all worthless. So if if you're unbelievably successful, but you're depressed or you're angry or you're full of hate or you're full of envy, your life can be hell. And so there's a big there's a big strain in the book of thinking about this inner landscape, whether I'm writing about Sir John Templeton. Or, or Bill Miller and his use of stoicism to get through really difficult periods in his life, or Arnold Vandenberg using um, self-hypnosis, affirmations, studying all these different spiritual paths. That, that to me is really critical because I was trying to explain if you want a rich life, don't just focus on the outer stuff. It's got, there's got to be more to this game. There's got to be this, this inner triumph. And then one of the things that became very noticeable as I explained how Arnold has transformed his life was the part of it is that he's very sharing, that he gets out of his own head and is taking care of other people. And, and I was having a conversation with Nick Sleep a couple of weeks ago, and he, you know, who does an enormous amount for philanthropy. And he was saying much the same thing because he's, he's very involved in, in helping people with depression uh, or, or who are suicidal. You know, he's uh, one of the philanthropists that, that he's involved with is, is helping those people. And, and he's talking about, he was talking to me about the importance of getting out of your own head when you're, when you're miserable and helping other people. That weirdly is the path to, to your own salvation. And I see that with Arnold. I see part of, part of Arnold's happiness is that what he's focused on the whole time is helping other people. And, and so I wanted also to, to give that sense of, of what the recipe is for a, a rich and successful life and that, that, that a key part of it is, yeah, A, you've got to get control over your thoughts and emotions, which Arnold did brilliantly. But B, there's got to be this element of service, of something beyond your own ego. And that, that to me, is a really profound truth in life. There's a, there's a, there's a, beautiful, uh, there's a beautiful teaching in Kabbalah, which is this, this sort of ancient form of wisdom that, that, that I've studied for probably the last 13 years or so, where they, they talk about how we, we naturally have what, what the Kabbalists would call the desire to receive for the self alone, right? It's me, me, me. How am I going to make money for me? How am I going to get a bigger house? How am I going to get my new kitchen? How am I going to get a, a, a Tesla or whatever? And what the Kabbalists say is that you, you take this desire to receive for the self alone and your trajectory over the course of your lifetime is to transform that desire into the desire to receive for the sake of sharing. And so you still, you still want all those blessings. You still want a nice house. You still want financial independence. You still want a beautiful family and good relationships and health and all of those things, but it's to share. And that's, a, that's such a profoundly important lesson to me. And, and in some ways, 
Arnold became a way for me to, to kind of uh, explore that theme because I, I, I think, I think there's nothing more important that that's our journey. I think is to transform the desire for the self alone into the desire to receive for the sake of sharing. And it sounds like a platitude, but I think like most true things, they're pretty simple. And when I see someone like Arnold, who's now in his eighties, I'm like, Oh, he did it. He actually transformed his selfishness, his rage, his depression, his self doubt into being loving, kind, sharing, decent, honest. And when you, when you see it up close, you, you feel it. You're, mm. you're like, ah, oh, that's, that's, I, I want to be more like that. And, and so that, that's a, it's a very long winded answer to your question, but I, I think you want to find a, find a role model in life who, who embodies so, so, sort of the best of what you want to be, not just because it's not the, it's not just the money. I mean, Arnold, I talked to him a few weeks ago and he was, he was gearing up to celebrate his 50th wedding anniversary with his wife who he loves. And, uh, and he, he works with his son, Scott, and, and I see their interactions. I see how much Scott and he love each other. And one of the things that was so moving to me when I was working on the book was I, 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 I was sitting in Arnold's office in Austin where we spent a couple of days together and he starts going through all of these old clipping folders that he's got, you know, of, of old articles about Scott who's now president of the, their investment firm. And, and there are these pictures from when Scott was a kid and it was a little vulnerable kid who, who then became a shot put champion and, and he became a shot put champion because, um, Arnold hypnotized him and coached him and, and transformed his mind. And he took this little vulnerable, weak kid physically and emotionally and transformed him. And, and I remember Scott sort of saying to me, yeah, I'm the only person whose dad used to tuck him in at night when he was 18, you know, cause he would hypnotize him at night before he went to bed. And as Arnold's looking at these old clippings about Scott, he really starts choking up and I could see from all these, all these years back, just how much pride and joy he took in this kid. And, and, and what was really extraordinary that I, I, I don't really talk about often is, is that, you know, S Scott um, was, was the child from a previous marriage of, of his mother's. And so Arnold, who had been raised in an orphanage, mm -hmm. takes in this kid who wasn't biologically his kid and loved him so much. And, you know, to see, to see someone, um, you know, to see that relationship where that was, that was a relationship by choice. It wasn't biology. They love each other because of the way Arnold behaved to Scott. And, and so that, that so there's, there's something very deep and profound and moving there. And I, this is not to say that Arnold's a perfect human being or whatever. I'm, I'm sure, he, I'm sure he has his flaws, but, um, but I spent a lot of time with him and, um, that, 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 that's a very powerful role model in life to see that and to think, yeah, what, how, how do you build a relationship with your kid so that decades later, they'll want to work with you. They'll look at you with that sort of love. They'll, um, uh, that, that you, you want to ponder on that, I think. What, how, how do you get to that result where at 83, you look back and you say, I think it's 83, 82, something like that. Uh, maybe 81, you look back and you, and you have those relationships. Um, you, you have so, so many people admire you and look, have, have been helped by you. And, and, and so, so that's why I ended the book with him and, and, and he's not, he's not intellectually brilliant, uh, smart but he's not intellectually brilliant. Um, he's not the richest person in the book, doesn't have his private plane, doesn't have his yacht, but there's, there's deep, deep success there. Yeah, no, I think that's lovely. And I, I'm, I appreciate you taking time to uh, go into that level of, of depth because also it doesn't just talk about sort of 
the fact that you chose him, but I think it also goes just to give people a glimpse of that this is a book that is much more about investing and we'll, we'll come to that. Now, of course, we can't talk about all the characters in your book. I've chosen a couple of ones that I wanted to go into a little bit more depth with, and then you can bring up anyone you want, of course. But just something that, again, appeals to me, not for the obvious reasons, perhaps, but um, in, in your chapter six, you you write about an unconventional investment partnership where the rewards fall to those who resist the lure of instant gratification. And because I think this is so much at, at odds with how the investment world functions today, but it's really very close to how my journey within this kind of long-term trend following operates, I would love if you could talk about sort of Nick Sleep and Case Sicaria and then Nomad Fund and, and, and just, just sort of, sort of the, their story uh, and, and some of the things that you've kind of taken away from, from that. Yeah. Nick and, Nick and Zach are these very, very unconventional people who were total outsiders within the investing world. As I, as I write in that chapter, Zach, whose family had fled from Iraq with nothing, I mean, I think they had a they had a Volvo that someone had given them along the way, and they would they would they were taken in in the UK by I think a, a, a Catholic charity helped them. I mean, they really had nothing, but had been quite powerful in Iraq. I mean, his father had been successful, and then they'd been purged. So he was a total outsider who wanted to become a meteorologist, and his parents thought it was stupid for him to be a meteorologist. So he never intended to become an investor, and Nick studied geography and geology, I think, at Edinburgh University and wanted to be a landscape architect and got a job as a landscape architect and got laid off. So he was like, God, what do I do? And he wanted to stay in Edinburgh because he and his wife had, had bought an apartment there. And so he's looking around thinking, well, what, what, do, what does Edinburgh do that it's good at? Well, there's IT, so I could get a job in IT and there's investing. And so he reads an obscure book about um, unit trusts and the like. And he's like, oh, that sounds interesting. It's a, it's an intellectual pursuit, search for truth. That could be interesting. And so, so they both started off not coming from the traditional route, not going, not getting MBAs, not being interested in finance, not, not really caring that much about money. And then it was much more about the, the search for truth for, for what, what what makes for a great business, for example? Um, what's the best business model? So they they were almost like philosophers within the within the world of investing, and so they they set up this fund nomad together um, that I describe as this very high minded peculiar experiment that most people wouldn't care about, except for the fact that in thirteen years they beat the market by I think. 804 percentage points. So it was this stunning success. And so, so I, I was trying to explain in the chapter, here's what they did that nobody knows about because they never gave any interviews. They wouldn't talk to people uh, because they had no interest in self-promotion. They had no interest in marketing. They had no interest in gathering assets. And they'd closed the fund for years by the time I wrote about them. And had sent back all the money. They'd, they'd retired at the age of 45, given back something like three and a half billion dollars, that sort of thing. At the moment where they could have become astoundingly rich, they were like, no, nope, we're done. We solved the puzzle of how to invest. And now let's solve the puzzle of how to give the money back to society in a way that creates the maximum amount of good. And so for me, this again was a real risk to write about a, a sort of legendary, but in some ways unknown duo who had closed their fund and had never given interviews. So, so they were kind of cult figures. So people like Bill Miller had talked to me about them because Bill had invested his own money with them. Um, Monish Pabrai, who's a key character in the book, when I asked him who I should write about, said, well, Nick would be an amazing person to interview, but he'll never do it because he's too private. And so I gradually became friends over, over many interviews, I guess, with Nick. Um, and then Zach, who was even more enigmatic, finally came and spent, I think, half a day with, 
with me and sit with me and Nick in their in their office on the King's Road in London. And so it's really an unknown story. Nobody had told this story. And I was like, really, I'm going to write 11,000 words about these people that nobody knows. And and partly what happened to me is that this this is during there, there was a really nasty Supreme Court battle here in the US. And it was really ugly and really polarized. And everyone was full of both sides were full of hatred and anger and resentment. And I looked at Nick and Zach and I, I was like, they embody in so many ways everything that I admire that's the opposite of what's going on in the political situation at the moment. And so in a way, it was my, I, I felt kind of impotent politically and socially, but I can write about these two guys who I think are really admirable. And so what was what was wonderful about them is that they they were conducting this very high-minded experiment where they said, how do we create a fund that's not really about the money at all? It's not really about trying to gouge our shareholders, trying to maximize our earnings. It's going to be an exploration of, of the concept of quality, which is something that they took from Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which is an, an inquiry. The subtitle of the book is an inquiry into values, if I remember rightly. And so they said, what would, what, what constitutes quality in the investing business. And that principle runs through everything that they did. So you think of the way that they structured it in terms of fees. They decided, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll basically not charge an annual management fee. We'll have a minuscule annual management fee that just covers our costs. And we'll get a percentage of the profits and we'll have a 6% annual hurdle. I think it was 6%. And, and then so, so if they didn't perform, they wouldn't make anything. And then at a certain point, they were like, now we'll change that. But instead of changing it to be better for them, they change it to be worse for them. And so they put their incentive fee in a holding bucket. And they say, well, so if we underperform after we earn the incentive fee, it'll go back to the investors. So at some point during the financial crisis, they, I don't write about this in the book, but I, if I remember rightly, they, say, they said to me, yeah, we were going to be working for years for free. We might never get back the money. And and they were like, we kind of liked that. That was kind of great. Like there, there was something really profoundly contrarian and outsidery about them that they actually, they enjoyed the intellectual experiment of, of running a fund that was not about the money. And they had the same approach, the same obsession with quality when it came to looking at businesses. So they said, what really constitutes a high quality business? And so they look at all of these different business models and they end up deciding, well, there's one that's better than all of the others. And what they concluded is they, they describe it as scale economies shared. And this for me was a real revelation where I was writing, where I was writing this chapter. I'm like, ah, that's what it's all about. And, and Manish Parabright once said to me, he, he read an early draft of the book and he said, the three most important words in the book are scale economies shared. And Manish, who's the, the star of the first chapter of the book, actually changed the way he invested after reading this chapter on Nick and Zach, which is an extraordinary thing because he, he realized that he'd been doing it wrong <laughs> and that, that there's stuff they understood. And, and so the scale economy shared model in many ways is embodied by Costco, where Costco was always criticized by Wall Street because their margins were really low. They weren't maximizing their profits. What they were doing is they were giving an incredible deal to their customers. And I think they would mark things up by 14% or something like that. Like they would never go above that. And so as they became more and more efficient and got these economies of scale because they became bigger and more successful, instead of using that success and profitability to line their own pockets, they would share those economies of scale with their customers to give them a better and better deal. And there's something really profound about that, because if you think of what we were talking about before with Arnold Vandenberg, that he embodied this capitalistic principle that you transform the desire to receive for the, sake, uh, for, the, for the self alone into the desire to receive for the sake of sharing. In a sense, a company like Costco was also tapping into this principle. They're like, yeah, the more we receive, the more we're going to share. And so this becomes, so to, to me, this is a really beautiful example of the way that these principles run through different areas of life. So you can see actually that 
instead of Costco's size becoming an anchor and it becoming mediocre as it became bigger, its size became a really powerful asset because it built in this aspect of sharing, of, of giving back the, 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 the gains of its scale to its customers. And so then when Amazon came along, Nick and Zach look at Amazon and they're like, they, they see um, Amazon Prime and they say, oh, wait a second. So Amazon Prime, they're going to give you free delivery of your stuff. And they're going to keep adding these other things. Like they kept adding, you know, free photos, free storage of your, sorry, free storage of your photos, free TV, free movies. And they were like, oh, this is Costco on speed. And so they saw very early, around 2004, 2005, I think, when Amazon was at around $30 a share, that Amazon had the same characteristic of scale economies shared as Costco, where they, as it grew bigger, it had these tremendous economies of scale. But instead of keeping all the profits for itself, as Wall Street would want, they kept giving a better and better deal to their customers. So faster delivery, um, free delivery. Uh, it's, and, and so again, I think Amazon tapped into this idea of, of scale economies shared rather than just scale economies. And so then once they had figured out that this was the best model, the best business model of all, they just loaded their portfolio with companies that operated this way. And, and so when they quit the business at 45, they basically, I, I think at the end, they probably had about 10 stocks in their portfolio, but Amazon had grown to about 40% or so of the portfolio and had maybe gone up tenfold by then. A lot of their investors had quit along the way because they were appalled at this company that was sort of out of favor a lot of the time, like in 2008, 2009, when it was getting crushed. They were like, really, you're going to put more than 20% in, the, in this one stock? And they just had the courage of their convictions mm -hmm. to keep betting on quality. And, and after they quit the business, I, I, I interviewed Nick about his portfolio. And basically, he, he had almost everything just in three stocks, which was Amazon, Costco, and Berkshire Hathaway. And Berkshire Hathaway also, if you look at something like Geico within it, is a scale economy shared model. And so there are aspects of, uh, there, there are also aspects of the culture of Berkshire that they love because it's, it's so long term. It's not looking just to please Wall Street in the short term. And when I talked to Nick again recently, those are still the three biggest stocks in his portfolio. So something like Costco, he's probably owned for more than 18 years, Amazon for more than 16 years. So there's something, there's something very profound about this approach to life, this obsession with quality, this obsession with things that endure because sharing is built into them. And so those companies like Costco and Amazon embody deferred gratification in some way because they weren't trying to screw their customers in the short term by maximizing their own profits. And so much to Wall Street's irritation, they were like, no, no, we'll we're investing for the long term in things that will pay off many years for now, many years from now. And Nick and Zach were doing the same thing in the way they approached investing. They were saying, well, we're not going to gouge our, our clients. We're going to set it up so that when we, if we were sitting, they, they very consciously thought about this. They said, if we were sitting on a, on a porch at the age of 80 or 75 or whatever with our customer uh, with a former client of, of our hedge fund and we were having a glass of, of wine, would we look back and think, wow, we really treated you in a fair and equitable way? And when I talked to Nick a couple of weeks ago, he, he was saying to me, he thinks in exactly the same way about the philanthropy that he's doing. He said, he said I want to look back in 20 years and think, did I do that right? Did I, did I do it? Did I give away the money in a in a wise, far-sighted, long-term way that created maximum benefit for society in the long term. And so to me, this gets at one of the most important mental models themes in life where you just say, okay, so how do I build my life around deferred gratification? 
this has to be a master principle in in a world where most people are being really short term and are focusing on 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 short term pleasures it becomes an enormous competitive advantage if you can shift towards deferred gratification and this runs through every area of life and so for, for me i'm kind of gluttonous and i'm addicted to sugar at the moment and chocolate and i can see that's it's you know that's these instant hits of energy that you want that's not deferred gratification and at the same time i try not to eat in the morning because it's like it's pushing myself through intermittent fasting to to just delay a bit so there's this there's this battle within myself over food which i'm not very good at controlling to try to defer gratification very easy for me to to defer gratification with alcohol drugs things like that like I, you know i i like wine but it's not a challenge for me not to drink exercise again perfect example of deferred gratification how do you how do you push yourself to be in discomfort or pain now because it'll benefit you over the long term so again i you know grudgingly i force myself to get on a on a peloton bike in my in my basement ne- next to my next to my washing machine and dryer so so it's called the 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 tour de laundry room in our family <laughs> and and so again it's an exercise in deferred gratification think about saving think about investing think about living within your means these are all forms of deferred gratification where you're sacrificing the pleasure now for a greater pleasure down the road. And so that was the topic that when 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 I think of the eye of the eye of the bullseye, when I think about Nick and Zach, oh, it's a story about deferred gratification. It's this idiosyncratic partnership where everything is built on on saying when I look back at the end of my life, will I think I did that right? Whereas most of us are thinking, give me the extra peanut butter uh, cup and chocolate chip cookie. And, you, you know, and, and Nick said very eloquently that most of the things that we get wrong in life, most of the mistakes we make are because we're chasing after the short term hit of energy. So once you understand a principle like that, if you deeply internalize it, you can actually build your life around it. And, and so at least now, even though I'm failing constantly on the food front, at least I know that's the battle. And, and, and one of the things that fascinates me, because I read in a fairly diverse and scattered way, is that this question of deferred gratification goes back thousands of years. So if, if, you, if you look at the book of Genesis, it's literally you have um, Esau, if I remember rightly, selling his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup. And that's a perfect image of taking something that's really valuable and giving it away for something that's kind of worthless, that, that gives you, that you need in that moment. And, and you know, if they'd had, if they'd had chocolate then instead of lentil soup, he would have gone for chocolate, you know. <laughs> And so I think we're, we're replaying that, um, that test again and again in our own lives. And once you become aware of it, you, you, know, you know what the game is, and you at, least, you at least you're not flying blind anymore. It's so powerful. It's, it's a, an incredible chapter. And, and some of the other things that I took away from it... Um... It's just some of the other sort of small anecdotal stories that I think is is again so at odds with how we do things. The fact that they had, I think they had put their Bloomberg terminal in a place where they had to stand so they wouldn't spend too much time in front of it. And today, of course, people have like 16 screens on their on their desk to just sit and, and stare at it all day. I mean, just a wonderful chapter. <laughs> mentioned earlier that there are some people who feature in your book as sort of main characters and then a few people who get some mentions and and from memory here i think the next person that i wanted to to ask you about it in a little bit more detail i know we are already spend more than an hour talking about these things but it's really it's guy spear he also comes across uh, from what i read and also what i've heard you talk about um as a really fascinating 
uh, individual who also do things that you would normally not necessarily expect from someone in in this uh, in this world um but it kind of goes to some of the same values so if if you don't mind tell a little bit about guy spear and 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 uh yeah yeah just whatever you pick from his story guy is an old friend of mine and we were at oxford together but i i, I don't really remember him well from oxford he was a couple of years above me and i think i slightly resented him because he was kind of good looking and 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 um charming and i i i i i don't know i think i think anyone any, anyone who looked um looked better than me and was dating beautiful women i was like ah, i i dislike this guy on uh you know uh on principle and then we met in new york a few years later and became close friends and i've been in, an investor in his fund the aquamarine fund for more than 20 years and i helped him work on his memoir the educational value investor and i and i still help him albeit much less than in the past on his annual um shareholder letter um which partly just gives me an excuse to spend time with him and so i've observed guy very closely over more than 20 years and in a sense the thing the thing that made us close i think was working on his book because that gave me that i i was more or less living with him in zurich at the time, I was just moving, I think, from London to New York. And my son was still at boarding school in England. And so I would go to Zurich on maybe a Sunday night and then would spend a few days with Guy. And then I would go back to London and I would maybe see my son. And, you know, it was a bit crazy. I was doing this for for week after week and we were sprinting to finish his book. And so it was a sometimes... When you're in the trenches with someone at a very high stress moment, you see them really deeply, and that that relationship that you build a bond that that's pretty unbreakable, hopefully. And 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 I think Guy was at a vulnerable stage there because he was he was coming up against this really intense book deadline, and he wasn't finished with the book, and he'd worked on a manuscript previously with another writer, and I came in and and he he's not born to write he, he's very very clever and he speaks beautifully but writing was harder for him and so i came in when he was struggling and he was kind of almost broken at that point by just the intensity of having to write a book on deadline while right while while managing a hedge fund and and i think part of the closeness that we got is because I kind of picked him up at a vulnerable moment and helped drag him over the finish line. And, and one of the reasons why it was so memorable for me is, so, and I was going through a lot as well. I, I, I had um, been living in London for years and I'd, I'd been running the European, Middle Eastern and African editions of Time um as the editor and then i got laid off and then i went to work at this other um job as a journalist that i kind of hated and so i kind of quit and started writing books and was ghost writing books and then and then i was like this isn't working living in london i'm gonna go to new york and i went back to live in new york which is where my wife and kids had uh, um had grown up and so it was this kind of weirdly tumultuous period for me where everything in my life was in transition and Guy is in this very intense period where he's trying to meet this deadline and write the last few chapters of the book. And so we end up spending a lot of time together in his house in Zurich and, and, and elsewhere as well. He would put me up in a, in a hotel where we would work together. In, uh, uh, we, even, we even did some of it in, in, in Greenwich, Connecticut. We stayed in a beautiful hotel together there. And so it was a very intense and personal experience. And one of the most memorable things for me was that I, I could see the guy wasn't looking to promote himself in a conventional sense. He, he was exploring all of the ways in which he'd made mistakes and had screwed up and had been tempted by the, um, the sort of the, the greedier casino aspect of wall street where people would say to him, you you got to raise more assets. You got to have a bigger fund. And you why why aren't you as famous as Bill Ackman when 
uh, you were at Harvard Business School together, and 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 Guy would write incredibly honestly about things like feeling jealous of Bill Hackman, and people don't usually do that when they're writing books about themselves. And you know, usually you would write about how brilliant you are and how wise you are. And here's Guy saying, "Yeah, I was jealous of this guy, and I got." Um, he, he writes very honestly about this experience early in his career where he, he went to work at a firm, D.H. Blair, that he realized was kind of like the firm in the Wolf of Wall Street. And he kind of totally tarnished his reputation. And Guy had come top of his class in economics at Oxford and was a brilliant guy. And um, suddenly finds himself persona non grata because he's, he, he seems unethical if he's gone to work for this firm. And so he talks very honestly about then discovering Buffett and realizing, oh, there's this other way to do things that's 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 honest and honorable and long term and and ethical. And so in a sense, it's a it's a it's a story about going from darkness to light. And there was a beautiful moment while we were working on the book where we, we would we would sit in his living room. Uh, sorry, at his dining room table often. And, um, and I, you know, I'm kind of nuts. So I would like have the Zohar, which is like this ancient kind of Aramaic text. And we'd read a bit of it and then we'd chat about it. And then we'd be like drinking lots of cappuccino from his super La Mazzocco machine that he'd imported specially from Florence, I think. And then, and, and then we'd be like, okay, let's work. And so so we would get into these kind of deep discussions because we'd kind of been primed by the fact that we were talking about these spiritual issues, for example, and what life was about. And I was going through this tumultuous period and he was in an intense period himself. And that's reflected in what we were writing because it's very raw and it's very honest. And there's a, there was a beautiful moment where we, we walked into the kitchen next to that dining room to get yet more cappuccino and yet more lint chocolate. And, um, and, and he was really excited by what we were doing. And he said, I don't care if this book destroys my reputation. I just want to give an honest accounting of who I am. I thought, what an extraordinary thing that is to have somebody who's so committed to telling the truth about who they are, that they are prepared to take the reputational risk. And that had a huge impact on me. And so to, to go back to the very, almost the very start of our conversation where you were talking about things like humility and candor and be, trying to be honest and stuff like that. That's partly because I saw, I saw Guy over the years and I thought, oh, so wait, so you can actually be truthful? You, you don't need to be spinning? You, you can actually expose your, your dirty underwear in public and say, yeah, this is who I am. And, and, um, there's something extraordinarily liberating about trying not to lie and spin. And I, I, I could see it. I, I interviewed Ray Dalio a, a week or so ago. Um, and uh, and one, of, one of my feelings as I was interviewing him is, oh, that's what it's like to be obsessed with radical truthfulness and radical transparency. That he's not having to there's not this delay where he's thinking about how to lie and how to spin. Mm. And I see that with Guy as well, where Guy is like, it, it, he's just going to tell you what he thinks. And I see it with Monish Pabrai, who's a very close friend of Guy's um, and, and kind of an important figure in my book, that they're telling the truth. And you see it with Arnold as well, that he's, Arnold would say to me when I, when I was writing about him for The Great Minds Investing, he said, when I was fact checking, he said, I don't think you should include me in this book. And I'm like, why not? And he's like, because my returns have not been good for the last few years. I'm having a terrible period and I'm out of favor and I've made these mistakes and I, I, I don't think I should be in the book. And so think of the, the, the power that comes from these people who are actually prepared to tell you the truth, tell you the thing that they should be concealing if it were just out of self-interest. And there's, again, there's a deep truth here where just as we were talking before about the, 
the the importance of transforming the desire to receive the self alone into the desire to receive for the sake of sharing, or the importance of deferring gratification in a world where everyone else or most people are going for instant gratification. There's another deep truth here where you're like, oh, if you're truthful um, and you're candid, it's very, very powerful. And this is something that I saw from Monish Pabrai as well, because Monish, Monish, who I write about in that first chapter of the book, is a, is a great fan of this book, Power Versus Force by David Hawkins, which again is, a, is about um, truthfulness at one level. It's, a, it's about certain, certain types of behavior make you either go strong or weak. And so being truthful, being candid, not lying, not spinning, um, makes you more powerful. Whereas I think we tend to be so fearful that we, 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 we're inclined to spin. I, I had this yesterday where I had made a mistake on something and, um, uh, I, I, uh, I was thinking, what, what do I do? Do I hide it? Do I spin it? And, and I wrote to the person I was dealing with and I was like, I made this mistake. And it's like, it's really uncomfortable. You really don't want to do it. Um, but actually it's incredibly liberating because then I don't have to think, so what was the lie? What was the thing I concealed that I have to remember that I concealed? And, and so this, it's a long-winded answer to your question, but, it, but again, when you think of what I'm talking about with Guy, we haven't mentioned anything about his skill as an investor. Mm. What we've talked about, and he is, is a very smart investor, but what we've, what we've really talked about is his behavior mm. and his candor and, and things like integrity. And so that, that's, if, if you're trying to figure out who you want to reverse engineer and be more like, who you want to pick as heroes, you want to look at these characteristics and think, well, what's really impressive about Guy Spear? It's not, it's not really the fact that he came to office class in economics at Oxford. I mean, that's impressive and he's very bright. Um, but I'm bright, you're bright. It's, I mean, a lot of us are bright. Uh, you don't even need to be that bright, you know, but, but to be candid and truthful and have integrity. And I see also with Guy, again, someone who's incredibly sharing, who spends his whole time trying to figure out how to help other people. And so that, that for me has been a big part of my journey over the last 20 years has been to 25 years really has been to look at the great investors that I, I, I've been interviewing and studying and think, okay, they can teach you how to get rich, but how do they, how do you live in a wiser way? What can, when you, when you hang out for five days with someone like Manish Pabrai in India, which I did for this book, what do you learn about actually how to live? And when, when you spend hundreds of hours with Guy Spear over 20 something years, what do you actually learn about how you want to operate in life? I, I'll give you another example of Guy that's a very small example. I once went to Israel with him and um, he had rented this beautiful house and um, he was there with his three kids and his wife, Laurie, who's lovely, and, and some friends of hers from Mexico and uh, my friend Ken Schubenstein, who's very good fund manager and now now neurologist um and i was there with my wife and there was a moment very early in the trip where i think um guy's wife laurie had basically given the nicest room in the house to to her close friends who'd come from um from mexico i think it was and so guy is renting this beautiful palatial home and he's in a room with his three kids um, while we're all, I was in the most beautiful room and it was a gorgeous house. And I just thought that was really interesting that he's, he, he appreciated the fact that his wife had had the sense to put them in the shittiest room with the three kids. Mm. And I thought that was really interesting. And he, and he didn't, he didn't take credit. Like it was him who had done it here. It was like, Oh, it's fantastic. Laurie was like, you, you know, I was about to take this room. And Laurie was like, no, 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 go. We're, we're in this room. And, and he wasn't annoyed by the fact that I was in a nicer room, was having peace and quiet with my wife, and that this other couple was in a beautiful room. He, he liked it. 
Mm. I think that's very interesting. So when you, these are very small examples, but when you see something like that, um, it's a, it's a tell, right? It's like, uh, oh, that's, that's interesting. And so that things like that, or that moment, moment where he said, I, I, I don't care if this book ruins my reputation. I, I just want to give an honest accounting of myself. When, when you see things like that, you, you, you don't forget it. It has a big effect on you because it gives, it gives you a sense of what really matters and, um, um, and what you want to clone from other people in the deepest sense of it. So I, I hope part of, part of what people get from these conversations like, like R1 Nils and, and from the book itself is, is that they, they look at these characters and they say, okay, yeah, I want to be richer. Yeah, I want financial independence. Yeah, I want to be financially secure. But what's the, what's the inner aspect of a successful life and a successful investment career. And if, I, if I'm so focused on the outer stuff of just getting rich and just getting the nicer car and stuff like that, it's, uh, it's a, I don't know, I don't want to be judgmental and pious and sanctimonious about it, but I think it's a stunted life. And so part of what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm writing about the people who I think are uh, operating on many different levels they've they've got the external aspect of investing down mm -hmm. they're thinking very intelligently about how to make money but they also are thinking very deeply about this inner game of what what it what constitutes an actually successful and abundant life and 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 i think if you if you're shallow <laughs> you just want the external stuff good on you maybe you don't need to think about all of these things but i i i for for me, the 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 deeper stuff is actually the more important, and that, uh, it's not to say that the the money isn't important because I I think that independence, that ability to structure your life in a way that's true to who you are, and not to have to worry about money, and is is hugely important. But you don't want to fall into the trap of worshiping the money and think that's what's going to make you happy. I think ultimately, when I when I look at a lot of these investors I write about it, what makes them happy. I think things, I, I see how happy Guy is helping other people. I mean, I, I, there was a moment where I, I, I think I first got this book contract to write this book, you know, five, six years ago, probably seven years, I don't know, something like that. And, and um, I told him about it. And uh, he was like, I, I think I'm happier than if something great happened to me. Um, you know, like, like I could see how giddy he was about my book deal. And that's something that the Buddhists talk about, right? Empathetic joy. It's, it's a very high level thing to, to actually get pleasure from other people's uh, good fortune. Good fortune yeah. yeah. And when you see something like that, you're like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be shifting towards. Mm. So, so, yeah, just look, look for these clues in the book about what really makes these people successful? And so, so when, when you look at someone like Nick and Zach, for example, uh, I, I talk about the fact that it's a relationship built on kindness. And so Nick said to me um, that, that good behavior has a longer shelf life than bad behavior. And so he and Zach have always been kind to each other and fair with each other and so when they were discussing setting up the company nick nick who was kind of the alpha dog and had been really successful and had already been working as a, a money manager while while zach had been a you know institutional sales guy at deutsche bank and hated it nick was like let's do it 50 50 we'll just split the business 50 50 and zach was like no i want you to have 51 percent of it so that if we ever have a conflict about something you'll make the decision. And Nick said to me, when someone hands you a loaded revolver and says, here, shoot me if you like, how can you behave badly? But many people would behave badly, but they, they decided that that was the way they would operate. And, I, and it was really striking to me that years after the fund closed, when I went to interview them, they still shared that office on the King's Road. And, and, and so if they had been screwing each other and taking advantage of each other, you know, maybe one of them would have got richer, but they wouldn't then be working 
they, they, they wouldn't then be sharing the same office all of these years later and still be friends. And, and, and so when you look back on hopefully a long life and you think, well, so I manage money in an equitable way. I treated my partner well. I have good relationships with my family and I've given money away in a way that helps society in a long-term thoughtful way. That's a successful life. But those, those sort of, um, the, the, those, are, those are not incidental side issues. That's, that's like a key part of the game. And so, so for me, the whole book, the whole project has been a kind of exploration of questions like that, of what, 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 what do I actually want to learn from someone like Nick Sleep or Zach or, or Sir John Templeton or Monish Pabri or Guy Spear? And so, yeah, I, I, I've probably become a better investor by studying all of these people, but I, I hope that I'm kind of on the path to becoming a better person because of it, because I can see what works. And I, I, I think what's, what's beautiful about studying great investors is because they're such pragmatists, because they're obsessed, as Munger would say, with uh, he, he, he talks about, I, I observe what works and what doesn't work and why. So because they're pragmatists who are obsessed with what works, it's not like writing about Mother Teresa, where you're like, yeah, I'm never going to be Mother Teresa. You're writing about people who are, who are great pragmatists, who are in the, in the mud, dealing with running a business, um, investing money, trying to outwit the crowd. And yet they're really obsessed with these questions of morality, ethics, how to behave well, what, what constitutes an abundant life, um, how to become more resilient, uh, how to deal with an unknowable future. So, so they're, they're a great filter um, for looking at all of these issues because, because they're, they're practical. They're not, they're not just floating off into the ether, you know, reading philosophical and spiritual books. They're actually, they're saying, this works. Behave like this, and it works better. Behave ethically with your partner, and it actually works better. Um, don't screw your suppliers, as Charlie Munker would say. You know, like like he's like I, my my approach to life is is not zero sum game. I want everyone to benefit, and so they they become an incredibly helpful model, I think, for for how to operate in life. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely, it's it's fascinating. Um, I had a, a few more people that uh, that I wanted to uh, sort of touch on, but I think we are going to be running out of time for that. But I do want to share with with uh, the audience uh, so uh, when they get the book and they dive in but some of the things that stood out to me again coming from the kind of the quant side of of the investment world but I found also the chapter with Joel Greenblatt and this whole concept of simplicity is the ultimate sophistication even though it's an it's an old quote but in my world that is the essence of what we do keeping it simple and as as you said earlier I mean you know finding the thing that worked you know, is probably at less than a percent of the work we do to get to distill to that level. You know, I often say that it's like trial and terror when you do research because you need to find all the things that doesn't work before you find the things that work. But someone like that, of course, you've mentioned Monish a few times, you know, fascinating uh, chapter, fascinating lessons that you take away from him. And another one that just stands out in again in my world is, of course, how it marks because this trend following is built on knowing what you don't know and the fact that history changes everything is yeah uncertain in in many ways and so again people should just go and 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 find the uh, some of those uh, nuggets in in your book but i do want to ask you a few sort of final questions as we start to uh, to to wind down i mean this is a book which and I think this is pretty clear now uh, from our conversation. It's a book not only for investors at all journey, but it's actually also a book that I hope my kids would read too, because it's a way to figure out how to live a fulfilling life, so to speak. And um, and yeah, it's a book about not just uh, you know how to to make money for sure. But my final two questions is, is, is they're a little bit selfish uh, mm. in, in a way, um, because as, as, as we've talked about, I come from this world of um, systematic trend following. Mm. I have uh, and are currently working with one of the pioneers, but there are a few more pioneers who have these tremendous success and fascinating stories. 
across four, four or five decades in, in some cases. And I'm just curious whether you have ever, because the type of investors you're describing are, um, I wouldn't say they're all value investors, they're not necessarily value investors, but they are obviously not quant uh, as such based investors. But have you ever come across some of these other types of stories in your, because you've interviewed, you've had access to so many people. Um, so I'm just curious about that. Yeah. I mean, as I was saying, I was interviewing Dalio a week or so ago, yeah, sure. who's very much about man and machine, right? How do you combine man and right. machine, yeah. harness enormous amounts of computer power? And how do you systematize? How do you take ideas that I would say, to some degree, he intuits ideas, mm -hmm. and then he systematizes them into principles. And yeah. so, yeah, I, I worried about this when I was writing the book, that maybe I wasn't paying enough attention to that whole quant side, that there's, there was someone I interviewed at some length about um, her firm, which has a very heavy combination of, of fundamental analysis and use of computers with a lot, with a lot of, with a lot of PhD computer geeks there. <laughs> and, and I just, I ended up just not writing about it. I didn't go deep on that for various reasons. And, and it's something I need to explore more in a future book, I think, because there's, there is something kind of profound going on there. There's, there's, there's a, there's a tension, I think, between the type of investing that I tend to write about, which is very much based on smart individuals who understand some fundamental principles and then have extraordinary temperamental ability to go against the crowd and to be less emotional and more rational, which I think is kind of beautiful and appeals to me temperamentally. There's a tension between that approach and the, the sort of brute power of harnessing machines, being very systematic, eliminating emotion because it's the computer doing stuff. And there's, um, I haven't really got my head around this really think deeply about the implications of that and whether the type of investing that I'm writing about is, um, uh, is, is kind of going the way of the, the dinosaur and the dodo. It's interesting you say that. I think if you did, if you do go down that path at some point, I think what you'll find is, of course, that on one side, and I think this has been one of the challenges for, for us in, in our world, is that we don't have, to some extent, the same stories, the same narrative to talk about. But I think actually what you would find is that there's a lot of commonality between some of those principles that we just put into a computer because we can. Mm. And actually the way some of these investors that you've described so eloquently, actually what they do just from themselves, so to speak, within themselves, they, they are not, you know, um, probably impulsive, erratic people. They are probably mm. quite internally aligned and rules-based in many ways. So, so that's one thing. The fi my final question for you, William, if I'm trying to kind of distill uh, down to, again, combining my, my own experience and, and, and the stories we've talked about, you know, treating people fair, don't overcharge on management fees. Just, you know, if your clients make money, you should make money. A lot of the things that I've certainly experienced in, in my career and the firm that I work for. Um, but there's one thing that I think maybe above all, binds a lot of these successful investors together, but it's something that is so hard uh, for, for me and for us to kind of um, get new investors or potential investors to buy into. And that is this, how you become a long-term investor in a short-term world. That, and, and I actually think that that is, there are probably other things, but I do think this long-termism is something that, that kind of goes across all of the people you write about. That's at least how I remember your your yeah. book. So I'm I'm fascinated by by how you can get people, even if you can demonstrate and show them, look at this 45 year track record. You should really just don't worry about the next two, three, five, ten, fifteen years. But it's so hard to uh, to get people to buy into that. I think it's very difficult. It's it's difficult for us emotionally, temperamentally to be long term. We're we're all looking for that instant hit. 
of, yeah. of energy from Esau's bowl of lentil soup right. that would now be, you know, popcorn or some uh, sugar charged thing or my 12th cup of coffee of the day. Um, <laughs> So, so I think our, our wiring chemically um, pushes us to be short term. Um, and then there are a lot of pressures socially to be short term. So think of, um, think of how it messes with your head when you hear that your neighbor or your idiot cousin or whoever it is has just made 25 times his money on Bitcoin or Tesla or stuff. And, and you've been quietly and patiently trying to make your 10% a year or 12% a year or, or whatever it is and trying to survive and not get knocked out of the game. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of psychological pressure from seeing, seeing people hit the jackpot and not focusing on the people who thought they were buying Tesla, but in fact, we're buying, you know, pets.com. So we're focusing on the survivors. We're focusing, you know, when I talk to you about Nick Sleep and Kay Sicaria, and they literally, they have most of their money in three stocks and it's Amazon, Costco and Berkshire. There are plenty of people who put all their money in three stocks and lost mm. and wrecked their careers. And so it's very easy to get knocked off course by jealousy, envy, our own yearning to jump on bandwagons um, that are sort of speeding along and everyone else is, is kind of giddily shouting from on top of the bandwagon, look how well we're doing. Mm. And so I think part of what you need is this ability to say, yeah, that's not the game I'm playing. And actually to have the courage and the self-awareness and the patience and the understanding of your game to step back and say, yeah, great. I wish you well. Good luck. I hope your Bitcoin goes up another tenfold, but I'm not doing that because, or maybe I'm doing it with 2% of my portfolio or 1% or it's part of my play portfolio or it's part of my anti-inflation portfolio along with a bit of gold and, a, and my home and, and, you know, a couple of works of art or whatever. Uh, a bit of timber or whatever, but it's not, you know, you'll find someone who's putting 100% of their money in it or 200% of their money in it. And you're like, really? Well, maybe you'll do fantastically and maybe you'll become a billionaire or maybe you'll be ruined. Mm -hmm. And so the ability, the ability to understand the rules of the game, to understand the importance of survival, of staying in the game over many decades, not getting knocked out of the game, and to understand all of the pressures on you internally and externally that get you to screw up and be impetuous and impulsive and irrational, just understanding those things is really important because then you can say, yeah, I, I wish you all well, but this is what I'm doing. And at the same time, you have to be self-aware and humble enough to say, and what I'm doing may be wrong because the game may have changed. And so you can't just say, I'm not doing Bitcoin and Tesla and all of these other things because you guys are idiots. You have to say, has something fundamentally changed here? Are we in a different world where actually the way that I invest no longer is valid mm -hmm. or are the principles the same as ever? So, so, so you, you need the courage of your convictions to stay stable and long-term and centered and focused and disciplined but also kind of the humility to question yourself and say, yeah, and what if I'm wrong? And how do I protect against my, my own blind spots? And how do I make myself a continuous learning machine like Buffett so that I continue to update my model? Because if, if Buffett weren't doing that, he wouldn't have bought uh, Apple late in his career and made the most successful investment of his career because he always said, no, I don't buy tech. He, he wouldn't have bought into railroads. Um, and so you... In a, in a way, it gets back, Niels, to what I was saying at the start of our conversation, that often you need these contradictory traits. So as a writer, maybe you need the arrogance to say, yeah, I'm going to tell people the meaning of life and what these characters are all about and what works in life and what doesn't, but also the paranoia and the vulnerability and neurosis to say, yeah, but what if I'm wrong and how do I keep checking? Likewise, for an investor, to have the, the courage of your convictions to say, 
this is this is the game I'm playing, but also the humility to say, and if I'm wrong, will I survive? What are the consequences? And and how do I keep updating my uh, my knowledge and my learning and keep an keep an open mind? And so those, in a sense, are contradictory traits. So so it goes back. There's a beautiful line that I often quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald, where he talks about how the the sign of a first rate intelligence. And I'm I'm garbling this quote. The sign of a good intelligence is 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 this ability to hold contradictory ideas in your mind, two contradictory ideas in your mind at once, while still managing to operate well. And and so I think that's helpful. This is this is one of the reasons why investing is so difficult is because there are all of these pressures to get knocked off your off off course, and because the game is changing, because nothing stays the same. And. <laughs> I was quoting something to my daughter the other day. There's a, a guy called Ian McGilchrist, who's a very brilliant um, Scottish uh, neuroscientist and, and author. And he was he was doing a podcast interview. Someone was telling him why why there's going to be no afterlife and and why all these people are stupid. And McGilchrist said it behooves us to be more humble. And he was basically saying to this guy, "You don't know shit." Right. And it behooves us to be more humble because he was saying we don't even understand what matter really is. When we really go deep into understanding things like matter and consciousness, we realize that we don't understand anything. Our knowledge is so small. And so it behooves us to be humble to say, yeah, I think this is how the game works. Yeah. I think this is what I should do. Yeah. I think I should be long-term, but what if I'm wrong? Mm -hmm. and, and how do I hedge against my own incompetence and my own blind spots and my own uh, arrogance and all of that? So, so, so it's a hard, it's a hard game, but, but this is what makes it fun, right? Is the fact that it's nuanced and endlessly complex and changing and, uh, and that it's both an outer game and an inner game. So that this, this is, this is why we can, we can talk for so long about it. No, no, absolutely. And, uh, and you're right. We could definitely continue, but I want to be respectful of, of your time. William, this has really been amazing we're going to wrap up this uh, conversation and i really can't thank you enough for being on the podcast for essentially condensing what you have learned over decades in the presence of some of these extraordinary people with me with my audience it's been incredibly interesting to learn about your journey and the lessons that you've taken away from some of these people and to all of you listening today i hope that you were able to take something from today's conversation onto your own investment journey and if you did, please share these episodes with your friends and colleagues and send us a comment to let us know what topics you want us to bring up in the upcoming conversations with industry leaders in the world of finance and investing. You can, of course, find links to William's work on the show notes page. So please make sure to check that out. And oh, by the way, I should say now for people who are listening on Spotify, you can now give rating and reviews on Spotify. So if you have a few extra minutes, we would be grateful for one of those. From me, Nils Kastroblasen, thanks for listening, and I look forward to being back with you on the next episode of Top Traders Unplugged. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.